Erev Tov, everyone. It is Wednesday night. It is 8 p.m. here on the east side of the United States, here in the diaspora. This is the Maimon Bay Knesset. Therefore, it is the Torah study in depth with Rabbi Ariel and Rabbi Anshul. And speaking of Rabbi Anshul, let us go ahead and bring him in. First, we'll get his picture up here so you can see what he looks like. And uh, we'll bring him on. You are on now, sir. And I've told everybody, maybe they'll want to see my picture. <laughs> <laughs> they ain't got no choice. I mean, I, I have control. It's kind of like the outer limits. Yep. <laughs> so we're going to we're going to break away from our our regular Torah study today because shortly, in about uh, 10, 15 minutes, it will be Lag Bomer. So we're going to. Uh, we're going to break away, and we're going to do a study on Lag Baomer and uh, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, and uh, we'll see what uh, what the various rabbis, the Talmud, and the Torah have to say. In the uh, chat room, we have Simcha, and we have Donald, and we have Marshall, and if you're watching in the background, and uh, more to come in later on. So... Happy Lag Baomer, my friend. Yep, everybody. It's most people, I don't know if most people know, but he is the rabbi who wrote the Zohar. Yeah, he's the one that the mysteries of the Kabbalah were given to. Correct. So, uh, Moria was the one who actually wrote the Zohar. Uh, actually, also come, uh, I should say, actually put it in writing. Yeah. yeah. So, But we also commemorate something else. Because in between the weeks of Passover and Shavuot, there was a plague that raged among his disciples. Right. And yeah, they all died. And All but one. They died. They I'm sorry? All but one. All but one. Rabbi they died because Shimon they didn't actually each other. Which, to me, what is going on in Israel right now, it's the same thing. It's, it's this disrespect of everything. Who needs enemies? We have our own enemies inside. Yeah, so just to kind of bring everybody uh, kind of up to speed, the story as we received it um, is that basically that um, uh, the plague um, uh, came into the uh, students of Rabbi Akiva's yeshiva and uh -huh. um, uh, pretty much decimated. How many, how many died? 2,400? Yeah. Yeah. 2,400 um, students died from this plague. And they said the reason that they died was because they basically refused to show respect to one another. And one of them survived. There was only one survivor of all of them. And the plague actually ended on Lagbo Omer, the 33rd day of the Omer. Now, the one who, re who survived that was Rabbi Shimon Bar, Bar Yochai. Many yes. years later, Rabbi Yochai passed away on Lagba Omer. So, and the day that he passed away, when his students came and everything to uh, to see him and everything, pray for him and so on, uh, he basically told them that uh, they were to make the day a celebration because he said it was the day of his greatest joy, that he was going to be leaving this corporal world with all its problems and pains and everything, and he was going up into the upper realms. Yeah. So, so anyway, so we're going to be taking a look at mainly Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, but some other aspects of, uh, of the... Um, Lagba Omer, the 33rd day of the Omer. Where did, where is this? You know, because it is a festival. Why, where do we see, actually find this in the Torah? 
Yeah, well, like like the shooting of the bows and the arrows, you know. Yeah, we were talking about that before we actually started, and I was asking, where did that custom actually originate from? Usually, that's what the children do. They they will go out in the fields and play, you know, with uh, imitation of bows and arrows. What it does, it commemorates the midrashic tradition that no rainbow was seen during the life of Rabbi Shimon. The rainbows first appeared after Noah's flood when God promised that never again will he devastate the world. When the people are deserving of punishment, God sends a rainbow instead. So uh, Rabbi Shimon's merit protected the world, rendering the rainbow superfluous. So most people don't know that during his lifetime there was no rainbow ever seen. That's right. Yeah. Well, yeah. There's a, there's a a number of things that we we find like that. That um, well, like uh, uh, Hezekiah. They say that during yeah. the reign of Hezekiah, it rained every Shabbat, so that the people would not go out and work. Uh huh. So that they would they would have to be home and they would have to observe the Sabbath, because you can't can't actually do anything when it's raining. Uh-huh. So you know we have those. So let's get into this. So we're oh. going to start out with this uh, this the cave and the uh, the carob uh, tree. Yeah, the miracle of carobs. You know. Uh, it is customary to eat carobs on Lagoma. Right. It commemorates the life-saving miracle that Rabbi Shimon experienced. Because for a period of 13 years, Rabbi Shimon and his sons were fugitives from the from the Roman uh, regime. Right. And they were hiding in a cave in the northern part of Israel. And mirac- miraculously, a carob tree grew at the entrance of the cave providing nourishment for the two of them. Yeah. And a spring. A spring also appeared. Yeah. So they had and they had food and they had water. By the way, his grave is in, in the town or the city of Meron. Right. Yeah, and that's a that's another thing. I mean we're going to see videos posted of this probably all night long where people go to the grave of uh, what which is the most prevalent one, which is the grave of um, Shimon Bar Yachai to his kever, yes. and they light these huge bonfires. Yep. What's What's not so well known is that they also go to the grave of Rabbi Akiva and do the same thing. Yep. And this, they 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 burn those bonfires all night. Yeah, and there's a lot of singing, a lot of dancing. Maybe a little bit of drinking. Therefore, but, uh, the, therefore, during the Omer, like Omer, <laughs> the morning practices are suspended. Right. So you're allowed to have weddings. You allow uh, the children that reach the age of three to have their uh, haircuts. There's music. There's dancing. Well, and that's then, and that's the, that, that's the, the whole thing because if we look in the Torah, the Torah does not say anything about Lagba Omer. Uh, the the uh, we know that we're supposed to count the omer, that's very plain. It's very clear in the Torah uh, that we are to count the omer. But there's nothing about it being a mourning period. So we know it becomes a mourning period because of the plague that struck Rabbi Akiva's students. So it's considered a mourning period. But on the thirty third day of the omer, the plague stopped. It ended on the thirty third day of the omer. So hence. That's yeah, so hence we treat that period from the the beginning of the Omer to the 33rd day of the Omer as a, well, to the 32nd day of the Omer as a mourning period, and then the mourning period ends on the, on the 33rd day of the Omer. In the Sephardic rule, in the Sephardic tradition, uh, the morning starts again the day after because right. we don't know exactly when it starts. When Lagbo starts or when it ends, so. Well, and that that's also true. We were talking about this before that uh, there is the the thirty third day of the Omer is 
Ashkenazim recognize as the day of the end of the plague and the death of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. But yes. there is a the Sephardic tradition, which is that this didn't actually happen until the 34th day. Correct. So Sephardim will celebrate Friday uh, as that day where the Ashkenazi, pretty much in general, though, pretty much everybody celebrates it now on the 33rd day. Uh-huh. But, so let's go into and see what the... Uh, the Babylonian and the and the, Yerush, the Talmud Yerushalayim has to say about the uh, about Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. Go ahead. Okay, so so and I've got this from um, uh, Safaria, uh, which is a great great site if you're looking for any Jewish text. Uh, so anyway. So both the Babylonian Talmud and the Jerusalem Talmud tell the story of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai uh, and the cave. Uh, there are plenty of similarities between the two, but many differences stand out as well. Uh, so we have both. Uh, we're going to have both of the uh, versions here, and then we have a number of questions that they actually pose in here, uh, such as, uh, what does Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai see that upset him? Why does Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai go into the cave? What is the function of the cave in each version? Because remember, we have two versions here. What transpires while Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai is in the cave? Why does Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai decide to leave the cave? What happens after Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai leaves the cave? Where are Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai's what are Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai's primary concerns, complaints, and fears in what we're going to read? What's your perception of the kind of teacher or leader uh, Shimon Bar Yochai is in each version? And what do you think the editors of the respective Talmuds? I uh, want us to learn from the stories of Shimon Bar Yochai. Now, there is a, a marked difference between the Babylonian Talmud and the, um, and the Talmud Yerushalayim, <clears throat> or what some people actually refer to as the um, Palestinian Talmud. Um, <laughs> yeah. Well, because at the time that it was actually written, that was the, what the Romans called it. And, and just to be clear, the only people who were ever referred to as Palestinians were the Jews. And you can find that it's in the it's in the writings of Josephus. And the writings of Josephus had to be sanctioned by the government of Rome before they were allowed to be published. So every mention of Palestinian in the Writings of Josephus refers to only one people, refers only to the Jews. So, as far as these Arabs that are in Gaza, uh, yeah, yeah, there is no well, such thing as a Palestinian Arab. There really, there really are Pal uh, uh, Jordanians, right, or Egyptians, or. Um, uh, oh, uh, Qaddafi's. Um, where's Qaddafi? Uh, Qaddafi? The country Qaddafi was in. Um, Libyans. Pardon? Libyans. Libyans, yeah. Okay, Libya. Thank you. Well, actually, okay, so uh, during that period of time when the Ottoman Empire and so on and so forth, yada, 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 uh, Israel was a place that those countries would send troublemakers. They were ba basically being banished from the country, and they would be sent to Israel. It was basically like, um, uh, what do they call uh, Australia? Um, what was it? Um, oh, uh, Botany Bay. It was basically the Middle East Botany Bay. You know, that's where you sent all your criminals and stuff like that, uh, agitators yep. and uh, stuff like that. So, uh, the Jordan was in the Hashemite. They're, they're Hashemites, you know. The yeah. old, the old king, not the not the son. The old king. If you look, there's a book. I believe it's it's called the Black September. 
Uh-huh. And what happened? And what happened? And this is how the Alamby Bridge was built. He built it, and because the, because these people were causing problems in in Jordan. He gave them a choice. Either I kill you all or cross the bridge and go into Israel and I don't want to see you. Yeah. Because basically these, these people that are in Gaza, there is not one Arab country that wants them. I, wa- I would like to hear from any country, from, from, from anywhere, to want to have these people. Because let's say Saudi Arabia, they have enough land to give them... Oh yeah, uh, to make a hope for them, they don't want him. Yeah, well, I mean, just... Jordan had its opportunity to do something with them. Uh, they could have declared a a Palestinian country when they controlled that when they were Jordan or Trans Jordan or whatever. The Ottomans could have done it. Uh, the Egyptians could have done it. They all had the opportunity to do it, and they didn't do it. They don't want them. They don't want them. Well, and, there, and there's that other reason, too, because we've talked about this before, about that region is, a, is basically it's a cursed area. Nobody wants it. You know, Israel right. never, Israel, even though it was supposed to be part of Eretz Israel, Israel never had that area because they didn't they want it. Because that's where the Philistines were, yep. who were basically they were Greeks, and but it was it was said that that land was cursed and nobody wants it. The Egyptians didn't want it. Israel didn't want it. Nobody wanted it. <laughs> okay, so let's get back uh, into the uh, into the Babylonian Talmud first, and this comes from Tractate Shabbat, Folio thirty three B, starting at verse five. In this Baraita, a Rabbi Yehuda is, is described as the head of the speakers in every place. The Gemara asks, why did they call him the head of the speakers in every place? The Gemara relates that this resulted due to an incident that took place when Rabbi Yehuda and Rabbi Yossi and Rabbi Shimon were sitting, Rabbi Shimon ben Yochai, uh, were sitting in Yehuda, uh, and, or sitting, and Yehuda, son of converts, sat beside them. Rabbi Yehuda opened uh, and said, How pleasant are the actions of this nation, the Romans he's referring to, as they establish marketplaces, establish bridges, establish bathhouses. Rabbi Yose was silent. Rabbi Shimon ben Yochai responded and said, Everything that they established, they established for their own purpose. They established marketplaces to play, place prostitutes in them, bathhouses to pamper themselves, and bridges to collect taxes from all who pass over them. Yehuda, the son of converts, went and related their statements to his household, and those statements continued to spread until they were heard by the monarchy, or the Romans. Uh, they ruled and said, uh, Yehuda, who elevated the, uh, the Roman regime, shall be elevated and appointed as head of the sages and head of the speakers in every place. Yose, who remained silent, shall be exiled from his home in Judea and punished and sent to the city of Zipporah in the Galilee. And Shimon, Shimon ben Yarchai, who denounced the government, shall be killed. Rabbi Shimon ben Yarchai and his son, Rabbi Elazar, uh, went and hid in the study hall. Every day, Rabbi Shimon's wife would bring them bread and a jug of water, and they would eat. When the decree intensified, Rabbi Shimon said to his son, Women are easily impressionable, and therefore there there is room for concern lest the authorities torture her and she reveal our whereabouts. Uh, They went and they hid in a cave. A miracle occurred. And a carob tree was created for them as well as a spring of water. 
They would remove their clothes and sit covered in sand up to their necks. They would study Torah all day in that manner. At the time of prayers, they would dress, cover themselves, and pray, and they would again remove their clothes afterwards so that they would not become tattered. They sat in the cave for 12 years. Now, Rabbi Anshul just said 13. He's actually correct. Okay, so 12 years there in the cave. And uh, as they sat in the cave for 12 years, Elijah the prophet came and stood at the entrance of the cave and said, Who will inform Bar Yochai that the emperor died and his decree has been abrogated? They emerged from the cave and they saw people who were planting and sowing. Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai said, These people abandon eternal life of Torah study and engage in temporal life for their own sustenance. The Gemara relates that every place that Rabbi Shimon and his son, Rabbi Elazar, directed their eyes would, would be, was immediately burned. A divine voice emerged and said to them, Did you emerge from the cave in order to destroy my world? Return to your cave. They went again to and sat there for 12 months, making 13 years. Uh, they said, The judgment of the wicked in Gehenna lasts for 12 months. Surely their sin was atoned for in that time. A divine voice emerged and said to them, Emerge from your cave. They emerged, and everywhere that Rabbi Elazar, Elazar would strike, Rabbi Shimon would heal. Rabbi Shimon said to Rabbi Elazar, My son, you and I suffice for the entire world. As the two of us are engaged in the proper study of Torah, um, the sun was, uh, okay, as the sun was setting on Shabbat Eve, they saw an elderly man who was holding two bundles of myrtle branches and running at twilight. They said to him, why do you have these? He said to them, in honor of Shabbat. They said to him, let one suffice. He answered them, one is corresponding to remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. <laughs> from Exodus chapter 20, verse 8. And the one is corresponding to observe the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Same reason why we light two candles on Shabbat. Okay, uh, that comes from Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 12. Rabbi Shimon said to his son, See how beloved the mitzvot are to Israel. Their minds were put at ease and they were no longer as upset that the people were not engaged in Torah study. Rabbi Pinchas ben Yair, Rabbi Shimon's son-in-law, heard and went out to greet him. He brought him into the bathhouse and began tending to his flesh. He saw that Rabbi Shimon had cracks in his skin and his body. He was crying and the tears fell from his eyes and caused Rabbi Shimon pain. Rabbi Pinchas said to Rabbi Shimon, his father-in-law, Woe is me that I have seen you like this. Rabbi Shimon said to him, Happy are you that you have seen me like this, and you had not seen me, had you, as had you not seen me like this, you would not have found me in this place, in this prominence, in um, this prominence in Torah. As the Gemara relates, at first, when Rabbi Shimon ben Yahai would raise a difficulty, Rabbi Pinchad ben Yair would respond to his question with 12 answers. Ultimately, when Rabbi Pinchad ben Yair would raise a difficulty, Rabbi Shimon ben Yochai would respond with 24 answers. Okay, so that's from the uh, Talmud Bavli. Babylonian Talmud. Pardon? That's the Babylonian Talmud. Right. So, um, and 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 this thing about with Rabbi Pinchat ben, uh, ben Yair 
and Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. Um, yeah, there is there is another uh, comes from Baba Metzia, two other rabbis, uh, and uh, I think we're going to get to, we're probably going to talk about this this summer. I can tell you that much. We're going to talk about that one in the summer, and we'll probably talk about when we come back from our summer break. Let's catch up with the. Uh, chat room before we go into the Jer- Talmud Yerushalayim or the Jerusalem Talmud. And it says, um, yeah, Dal says the 34th day is how he remembered it. Um, while attending Chabad would celebrate on the 33rd. Um, so by, to be different. Yeah, by the way, I appreciate learning the difference between the t- t- 33rd and the 34th. Uh, what is the that is okay. Well, that is what I learned uh, long ago. Basically, referring to what you were ta- talking about. Uh, perhaps there would be. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I think he's talking about Gaza. Uh, perhaps it would make a uh, a great parking lot. Uh, I'm the, I'm in favor of turning it to, into a fifty thousand hole golf course. That's just me though. Um, okay. well, there's no grass. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay, so so let's move on to the uh, Talmud Yerushalayim and hear what the Talmud Yerushalayim has to say. Okay, so Talmud Yerushalayim from uh, Shavit, uh, chapter 9, verse 1 through 12 and 13. Uh, Rabbi Shimon ben Yochai was traveling in the sabbatical uh, when he uh, saw somebody collecting sabbatical produce, he said to him, it, it, is this not forbidden? Is, is that not a spontaneous growth? He said to him, we are not, are, okay, <laughs> let me slow down here. He said to him, are not you the one who permits it? He said to him, are not my colleagues disagreeing with me? He read to him from Ecclesiastes chapter 10, verse 8, he who tears down a fence will be bitten by a snake. That is what happened to him. Rabbi Shimon ben Yochai was hiding in a cave for 13 years, a carob cave, a carob cave, until his body was covered with rust. At the end of 13 years, he said, should I not go out and see what a voice is in the world? He went and sat at the entrance of the cave. He saw a catcher out to catch birds spreading out his net. He heard a heavenly voice say, acquitted, and the bird was saved. He said, no bird will be adjudicated without heaven, so much less a human. When he saw that uh, that words of intercession were given, he said, let us go down and warm ourselves in the public baths of Tiberias. He said, we need to do something like our forefathers. He graced the entrance to the city. They were putting up uh, duty-free shops and selling at wholesale prices, he said, let them purify Tiberius. He took lupines, uh, cut them up, and threw them down in irregular fashion. Where there was a corpse, it was floating, and it came to the surface. A A Samaritan saw him and said, should I not make fun of this old Jew? He took a corpse, went and buried it at the pure, at a purified place. He came to Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai and said to him, Did you not purify place X? Come and I shall take out a corpse from there. Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai saw by the Holy Spirit that he had put it there. He said, I decree that the upper ones shall go down and the lower ones shall uh, ones come up. So it happened to him. When he passed by Magdala, he heard a voice of, a, of the scribe who said, 
So Bar Yochai purifies Tiberius. He said, it should come upon me if I did not hear that Tiberius once will be purified. Even so, you did not believe me. Immediately, he turned into a bone heap. Okay, so very different stories between the uh, between Talmud Bavli and Talmud uh, Yerushalayim. I never, I never really understood the the uh, Yerushalayim uh, version because to me it's totally confusing. You know that, and that that's not it's not just in this case either. The the Talmud Yerushalayim tends to be a lot more esoteric. A lot yes. less straightforward. That's why I always I always went along with the Babylonian Talmud. <laughs> and and just so uh, just to be clear, uh, the Talmud, the Jerusalem Talmud, and the uh, the Babylonian Talmud were not created separate from each other. Uh, no. They were both created about the same time. Uh, and the sages from Babylon would travel to Jerusalem, and they would discuss these things. So, I mean, it was, they weren't created in a vacuum. I mean, uh, Rabbi, uh, uh, Bar, uh, Rabbi Barbar Hana was one of those people that would travel from Babylonia to, uh, to Jerusalem. Jerusalem. Or actually, Safed, right? And uh, would bring word about what they were discussing and what they were studying in, in Babylonia. And then, you know, they would discuss it. And then he would take back what they were studying in Jerusalem or Safed. Uh, and they would um, uh, take that back to uh, Babylonia. So there was a, a, a constant uh, interchange of information between the two. But the um, Talmud... Uh, not similar at all. Pardon? But they're not similar similar at all. No, they aren't. And the uh, the ba- uh, the um, Jerusalem Talmud tends to be a lot more esoteric, and you can just see that just from the, what we just read. That uh, there's some uh, I, you really have to kind of think about what they're actually saying to um, uh, to get an idea of. What is he actually talking about here? You know, what is this is what I'm saying is as as we rabbis we can talk to each other and we can try to figure out. For me, it's confusing. What about the the, the regular Jew who did not go through a rabbinical school or or, or yeshiva? It, it it would be totally confusing. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Babylonian goes straight and it's explaining. Point by point. Yeah. And that's why I always went along with the Babylonian Talmud. Well, you know, if I'm trying to look up something, I always go to the Babylonian Talmud. However, if I'm reading to study, I like to read the Jerusalem Talmud because it's just, it's esoteric. It really forces you to think. But again, like you said, you know, I mean, you know, we have the luxury and we have the education in back of us to be able to look at something like that. It's kind of like reading the Zohar. Yeah. You know, the Zohar is a very, very visual um, uh, safer. I mean, it's a, you know, a lot of, it's very allegorical. And, uh, you know, you don't. I I told you that I studied the Zohar probably a good part of 15 years. And, and the Zohar teaches you a lot of stuff. But there's also parts of the Zohar which goes into, into numerology. And people get stuck in it. Yeah. Because our minds can only go so far before it stops. And right. I, I believe I told you the story. Uh, I used to have three friends that we used to play. Uh, Sunday nights we used to play. Um, uh, what's the game now? My mm-hmm. English is gone. Um, you get master points and bridge. We used oh, to play bridge. bridge, okay. And one night we were sitting playing, and a friend, uh, another one came in, and he was happy. He brought in a big jug of whiskey, and he brought in a pizza. He says, I just became a father. 
got so we sat and, and we and we sat and I I didn't I didn't drink but I had a piece of pizza and one of the guys that I prayed with and he knew that I was studying the Zohar he said to me and read me my tea I said no and he says and read me my tea please I says I sense something wrong I says I don't want to read it uh, you know every human being has a weakness mm -hmm. and I did and stop so he says what did you see I said never mind forget about it he says well you started it now you got to finish and I said what what I saw is you're going to lose your father in three days because he saw me I turned white like a candle and he says, oh, you're crazy. I says, what, oh, you asked? I told you. Yeah. And three days later, his father passed away. And I lost three minutes because of that. And that's the day I stopped reading that part of the Zohar. I never looked back at the Zohar ever. Now, everybody, Tricky. you know, I mean, as long as we're on the subject. <laughs> you know, and again, you know, there are there are numerous interpretations of whatever he happens to be reading. Uh, the person is reading in the in the Zohar or the Book of Formation, even. Um, but you know, we bring our own knowledge and education with us when we look at these things. So when Rabbi Ansha looks at something in the Zohar. You know, he, he sees it from his perspective. You know, Correct. when I look at the Zohar, I see it from my perspective. It doesn't mean that either one of us is wrong. It means it doesn't that... doesn't mean both of us are right. Exactly. I mean, it's, it's just like Einstein said, and don't let anybody fool you. He was not an agnostic, and he was well-schooled in, in uh, uh, Kabbalah. Um, because most of these concepts are Kabbalistic concepts, uh, the unified field theory. Um, and this goes back again to my point. When I go, when I look at elements of the, the Zohar, when I look at it, I look at it from my point of view. Well, you know, I'm into statistics, I'm into math, I'm into uh, theoretical physics and stuff like that. So when I look at it, I see things like the Big Bang Theory, I see the Unified Field Theory, I see uh, uh, numer uh, um, numerical, uh, I can't remember what the term is, um, but it's a numerical progression. Um, the uh, the uh, Fibonacci sequence, um, uh, things like that, you know. Now, if Rabbi Anshul is reading the same thing I'm reading, he's going to see something completely different. But Every we human need, being is different. yeah, so, we need all of these. We need all of these because basically, what is Kabbalah trying to do? It's trying to explain what is not explainable. Yeah, it's mysticism. Yeah. So again, all of these all of these translations um, that people give us are basically they're actually correct, even though they may be de vastly different from each other. They are essentially all correct. But you look at what happens. What happens now to to Kabbalah? Ah, Yehuda Berg. Yehuda Berg. That was the guy I was trying to think of last night. The one I said should be yeah. taken out into the middle, into the streets of Safed and, and horse whipped. Yeah, okay. He's the guy. He's the guy that was uh, taking it to uh, all of those uh, fools in uh, California, in Hollywood. Yep. Yep. And you know, sell sell a bottle of water for six dollars to Madonna. Yeah, or you know, just basically. I mean, he's he basically is a charlatan. He said, the only reason these people were, were studying this stuff was they to, for its magical purposes, which was to uh, maintain their celebrity you know, and, and get rich. I'm sorry. That's not what the Zohar is about. All right. Okay. So, well, let's get back to this. Okay. Let's get back. Okay, so we're going to go into this next section, which is is, is about the, uh, you got to keep an eye on the time here. Boy, this is really flying by tonight. Yep. Oh, 
Okay, so this one is called 33, the magic number. Okay, so Lagba Omer is a day with tremendous hidden potential. At first glance, it is just another day in the post-Passover count, which is described in the Torah as leading up to the grain offering. So from Leviticus 25, uh, 23, 15, and 16, and from the day that you bring the sheaf of elevation offering, the day after the Sabbath, you shall count seven weeks. They must be complete. You must count the day count until the day after the seven weeks, 50 days. Then you shall bring an offering of new grain to the Lord. But as the, but as the period of time itself took on new layers of meaning, the 33rd day became, began to stand out. So again, we're going to the Babylonian Talmud uh, from Tractate Yevamot, uh, Folio 62b. Rabbi Akiva had 12,000 pairs of students. That's 24,000. 12,000 pairs of students in an area of land that stretched from uh, Givat to Antipatris. Is that right? Yes. Antipatris? Yeah. In, in Judea. And they all died in one period of time because they did not treat each other with respect. Going back to what we were start talking about at the very beginning. Yes. Okay, as the section continues, the Talmud clarifies that these deaths took place between Passover and Shavuot. In other words, during the counting of the Omer. Jewish yes. legal sources therefore explain that mourning customs are observed during this period, as we mentioned earlier. From the Shulchan Aruch, Morach uh, Haim. Uh, 493, verse 1 and 2. It is customary not to get married between Pesach and Shavuot until Lagba Omer, the 33rd day, because during that time the students of Rabbi Akiva died. The mystical traditions, much of which comes to us from Rabbi Yitzhak Luria, Ashkenazi, uh, that's actually his name, uh, Yitzhak Luria Ashkenazi, but we mainly refer to him as Yitzhak Luria, uh, who yeah. lived in the 16th century, ascribes deeper meaning to these weeks. This tradition maps a complex structure of seven of the Sifarot, or mystical heavenly spears, into the seven weeks of the counting of the Omer. So if you look at your counting of the Omer, we always end the, the daily count with that, that statement about the, you know whatever, whatever uh, imperfections I have caused in, caused in the Sephira, and then we read which Sephira that we're talking about for that day. Okay, so... In this uh, structure, I don't know, is that in the uh, regular Siddur? I know it's in the Sephardic Siddur. Yeah, it's in the Ashkenazic Siddur, too. Yeah, it's in the, uh, the Ashkenazic, too, yeah. Okay, so yeah. in the structure, which appears in many prayer books, Lagba Ormer is, at, is labeled as Hod uh, Shibahod. Okay. Sidur Edot Hamizrak, counting of the Omer on page 102. Today is 33 days of the Omer, which are four weeks and five days. The term Hod has many, has many shades of meaning in Hebrew. It can be beauty and majesty. It can be also gratitude. Or acknowledgement. Yeah. Here is oh well, uh, it should be it should come as no surprise that later traditions understood Lagba Omer as the day which expresses many of these attributes. Okay, uh, the mystical tradition identifies Lagba Omer as the day on which Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai died. 
Though there is academic controversy around that day, it is the an idea which had added much richness to the meaning of the day over the generations. Rabbi Shimon is traditionally seen as the author of the mystical work, the Zohar. And uh, the following source from the Hasidic master, Rabbi Zvi Elimelech Shapiro, uh, con, uh, con, connects Lagba Omer to a special kind of revelation leading up to the giving of the Torah at Sinai. Okay, so we go to B'nai Yisachar, uh, chapter 3, verse 1 and 2. Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai is called the Holy Lamp because to him were revealed secrets of Torah, that is, the secret of the light that was good, which is the hidden, uh, which is hidden in the Torah. Therefore, his holy book is called the Zohar, literally brilliance meaning a light which shines from one end of the world to the other, a good light which is hidden away in the Torah. This is why the day is best of days for giving of Torah, being Harsane. Uh, this is when the good light in the Torah began to show forth. As we have learned, and this day is the 33rd day of Lagba Omer. This is the day of the uh, Hilula, uh, rejoicing, of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, and uh, the very day on which he ascended to the heavenly heights. It also makes sense to assume that he was born on this day as well, because the Holy One sits and contemplates the years of the righteous from the from day to day. The very day Devon. on the very day on which the light that is good began to shine forth from the Torah, that is the best of the days uh, in the leading up of the giving of the Torah. It is the very day on which the holy soul that would reveal the path of the light of the light that is good uh, in Torah itself, was itself revealed. So I've always talked about two people, two sages, that were born and died in the same day. Right. And that was Moses and, and uh, Rabbi Ben Yechai. Didn't, uh, didn't, didn't uh, David Hamelik die on the same day he was born? They they have always debated that. Okay. Uh, I know that they've talked only about the rabbi and right and, and most, but they've also talked about King David. But there's always been a disagreement about it. So right, right, and I I, I just I just happened yeah. to think about that, remembering that I had uh, read something about that somewhere. But so anyway, in other words. Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, whole character is wrapped up with this day. He is the father of the mystical tradition, which is celebrated on the 33rd day. Okay, so we're at our halfway point. Let's go ahead. Well, actually, a little past it. Why don't we go ahead and take our break, and then uh, when we return, we'll continue on with this uh, study of Lagba Omer. Uh, so... Everyone, please stay tuned. We will be back in six. Let's all go to the lobby. Let's all go to the lobby. Let's all go to the lobby to get ourselves a treat. Delicious things to eat. The popcorn can't be beat. The sparkling drinks are just dandy. The chocolate bars and the candy. So let's all go to the lobby to get ourselves a treat. Let's all go to the lobby to get ourselves a treat. 
It's intermission time, folks, so hurry, hurry, hurry. Step right over to our refreshment center for the most extravagant array of refreshment goodies ever assembled under one roof. Enjoy breathtaking, mouth-watering goodies, everything from a snack to a delicious full meal. At our refreshment center, you'll find a large variety of goodies to satisfy your hunger, your thirst, or your sweet tooth. So hurry, hurry, hurry. Visit our refreshment center now. The show starts in five minutes. The show starts in four minutes. Show starts in three minutes. The show starts in two minutes. Show starts in one minute.
And now, on with the show. And we are back. Okay, so unfortunately, Rabbi Anshul had to leave. Um, he had some uh, important phone calls that he had to return. Uh, so um, he's said to uh, give everybody his apologies for having to leave early. But, uh, you know, that's the way it is. Life still goes on. So, so we'll pick up from here. Uh, probably uh, eh, we might, be, uh, might end a little bit early tonight because I don't really have anybody to, to discuss this with, but uh, we'll marshal on. Um, going back to the chat room, Donald says, I have a fear of reading the Zohar. As well, you should. There's a very famous story, and it's typical to uh, to read this story before starting the study of of the Zohar or the um, or the um, um, the Book of Formation or any Kabbalist text. Uh, and it's the story of the um, the four who went to Pardis, who went up to the upper realms. Um, Essentially, the reason that they went up there was to uh, kind of force uh, Hashem's hand and bring Mashiach into the world, which never has worked out for any rabbi who's tried it. Uh, and there are many instances where uh, uh, we see you know, what, what happens. It never a- ends very well. Anyway, there's the story of Rabbi Akiva, Rabbi Ben Zoma, which is who's one of my very famous uh, favorite rabbis, Rabbi Elazar, and Rabbi um, Rabbi. Uh, I think it, I think it's Shimon, but I'm not I'm not sure. Anyway, anyway, they 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 they. they studying the, the the Kabbalist texts and stuff, and they. They go up into the upper realms to, again, force God's hand to bring Mashiach into the world and rectify the world. Um, so the, the, the story goes to, on to tell that um, uh, Rabbi Elazar died on the spot. Rabbi Shimon, if I remember correctly, Rabbi Shimon um, uh, was mad, became mad. Um, no, no, I'm sorry. Died on the spot. Oh, Acher, Acher. Acher was the other one. So Rabbi Akiva, uh, Rabbi Avuya, uh, Rabbi uh, Elazar, and Rabbi uh, Benzoma. Okay, so Rabbi uh, Avuya, who is known as Acher, uh, becomes a heretic. Um, Rabbi Elazar dies on the spot. Rabbi Benzoma goes mad. And when they say goes mad, they said basically he was, he was in this world and he was not in this world. Okay. Basically he was jumping between, between the upper realms in this world and people thought he was, he was crazy. Okay. And then you have Rabbi Akiva who came away unscathed, but not completely unscathed, because we find out later in Rabbi Akiva's, well, at the end of Rabbi Akiva's life, that the Romans actually flayed the skin from the back of him, and they said that that was the punishment uh, that Rabbi Akiva uh, suffered many years later because of what he tried to do. So nobody ever gets out free. Okay, so... Anyway, that story is also always read, or, or well, it should always be read, before studying the mystical text because it's a very severe warning because these things can be easily misinterpreted, hence why Abuya became Akhar uh, and later became Abuya again later on. Uh, or, you know, again, it's dangerous stuff. Rabbi Elazar died on the spot, and then Rabbi Akiba, or Rabbi Benzoma, the people thought he was absolutely crazy because he was basically jumping from one bridge to the other. Okay, so uh, yeah, no kidding. Uh, yeah, I mean, there's many stories of of rabbis. Um, 
uh, especially Hasidic rabbis for some reason, uh, trying to force God's hand to bring Mashiach. Uh, and uh, like I said, it, it never, never, ever works out well for them. So anyway, getting back to our text, we're talking about the uh, the 33rd day. Uh, and we talked about um, the whole uh, the whole character as wrapped up. R- Rabbi Shimon Ben Yochai's whole character was wrapped up on that third, 33rd day. Okay, but there's more. Uh, the, his, the Hasidic master, Rabbi Levi uh, uh, Yitzhak of Berjev, uh, finds a hint for Lagba Omer in the Torah, which identifies it as a, as a traditional day between the exodus from Mitzrayim, or Egypt, and the revelation at Sunaim. Okay, so we go to uh, Kiddushat Levi, uh, uh, commenting on Genesis um, and uh, why it's 839. Uh, Genesis 3148. Whereas Yaakov named it uh, Galil, Galen. This verse contains the allusion to 33rd day of the counting of the Omer. Because the letters of the word Gal, Gimel Laman, have the numerical value of 33, hence why it's called Lag Beomer. Okay, the connection between the two can be explained through the teaching of our sages that God appeared to Israel at the Sea of Reeds, uh, the Om Suf, as, um, as youth and at the giving of the Torah as an age wise men. Now, if you remember the Song of Glory that we say every Shabbat, uh, that, uh, you know, uh, aged, um, aged, uh, aged on the day of judgment and um, uh, young on the day of battle. Um, anyway, so this is like a child whose father trains him to go to school through enticement, telling him that there is something which he wants there. Through playing on his desires, his father accustoms him to go to school and thus is able to learn such Torah with him. So too God, who showed us many signs and wonders at the Yom Suf, uh, these miracles were not an end unto themselves but rather meant to show that there is a God in the world and, that, and to arouse our desire to serve him. God did wonders at the Yom Suf, the Sea of Reeds, uh, in order that we should desire to receive the Torah and serve him wholeheartedly. The initial aspect of the Exodus light the first 33 days of the Omer. But Lagba Omer begins the illumination from Sinai, the receiving of the Torah. As is wrote, the light of the Exodus was a preparation for the giving of the Torah. The miracles and the wonders were meant to arouse the desire for receiving the Torah. By naming the pile of stones Lag, Ad, uh, the 33rd day would serve as witness. Yaakov alluded to Lagba Omer, the day on which the four shifts from miracles to salvation to the receiving of the Torah. The word Ad is derived from um, Adim, Ad, Adi, uh, in Ezekiel and uh, Shemot, Exodus 33.5, uh, leaving off their finery. Uh, uh which we discussed uh, last week in our Torah study. Uh, in other words, until Lagba Omer, uh, Am Yisrael, were still under the influence of the miracles accompanying the Exodus, whereas from that time 
on, they were illuminated by the light of the coming revelation at Sinai. This is hinted at the uh, at, at in the letters of the Ayan Dalit, which implies the Torah. Now, not everyone is excited about introdu- uh, introducing this holiday in the source below, the Haftam Sof- Sofer, uh, a famous 18th century legal scholar, uh, expresses opposition to making Lagba Omer into the type of festival that it has become. But he nonetheless records a tradition which marks the 33rd day of the Omer as representative of yet another blessed tradition. So from the responsa by the Hatam Sofar, Sofar uh, in Yore Dea, uh, 233, verse 11, as it appears in the Midrash that from the day that the bread which they brought from Egypt was finished, they went three days without which means that the manna began to come down on Lag Be'omer. It would be appropriate to mark this day in some positive way, even though this seems to be in opposition to the Gemara. If the mystical traditions surrounding the 33rd day of the Omer aren't convincing for you, here's another idea. The manna that rained down from heaven in the desert first showed up on Lagba Omer. And that in itself is a reason to celebrate. Okay. So we have, uh, <laughs> that's, uh, that's basically it, folks. That's uh, what I had. I was expecting to do more discussion, but, you know, uh, Life is what life is, and uh, you know, uh, Rabbi had to uh, had to take care of uh, some things. So uh, um, we're glad he was there with us for the time that he was with us. Um, so I just uh, check on the uh, chat room, see what's going on here. Make sure I didn't miss anybody uh, when we were. Going through here. Simcha. Uh, I, I, I don't remember if I mentioned you. Okay, let's just run down the list again. Simcha is in the room. Donald is in the room. Marshall is in the room. At least uh, they're the ones that are actually typing in the chat. Uh, we know there's a few people in the background uh, watching. And uh, we're glad you're all here. I uh, hope you have a wonderful log, Mo Homer. Um, Thank you, Marshall. Marshall says, excellent session. I agree. <laughs> so uh, we will get back to our uh, regular Torah study uh, next week. Uh, next week um, is our last week uh, for the summer. Uh, as you know, the uh, Rebetzin has uh, more or less uh, told me that from, uh, well, starting a few years ago, that uh, I was to take uh, the summers off. And as um, Hashem said to Abraham, listen to your wife. And so, therefore, I am going to listen to my wife, and I am taking the summer off as I have for the last few years. Uh, I think we did um, close to 15 years where we did year-round, and it was starting to wear on me just a little bit, and... uh, my wife and I both like to go fishing, and my wife more so than I. I mean, she really likes to go fishing. So we take the summer off to do some fishing and do some other things. So um, next week will be the last week for our broadcast. Uh, we will be back. Uh, Shabbat services go on as usual. They always go on as usual throughout the year. Uh, it's just at the classes uh, and Zeta Story Corner will uh <laughs> be suspended for the uh, for the summer. We'll go on hiatus. Let's put it that way. Go on hiatus. Not suspended. Go on hiatus. Take a little break. And we will be back uh, right after the high holiday, hol- the high holy days. And we will pick up where we left off. So um, we will uh, um, 
yeah, that's uh, that's about it. So uh, don't forget that um, that uh, uh, Friday night at 8 p.m. is Kabbalat and Mariv Shabbat, and then Shabbat morning at 10 a.m. Eastern is Shacharit and Musaf, and then again uh, next week um, Monday, uh, 8 p.m. Central uh, Eastern will be uh, Zeta Story Corner, uh, and Tuesday. Uh, 8 p.m. Eastern, all times 8 p.m. Eastern, except for Shabbat, uh, will be, uh, again, the rabbis discuss, and then um, the Torah study again on Wednesday, and uh, then we will be off for the summer, and again, uh, the um, uh, Shabbat services and uh, the holidays and festivals will go on as they always have. So uh, until... uh, until, uh, well, I guess until Shabbat, uh, we will just simply say, Laila Tov. <laughs>